Hello, Gavin. Nice to meet you. Ah, uh, you too. Thank you very much for your time for agreeing for this interview. No so I'm going to introduce you. Uh, so Gavin is a director of technology at the Consultants E and lead tutor on Nile and University of Chichester's MA in Professional Development for Language Education. Uh, he has worked in education for the past 30 years. Well, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> and it, just, give, it just means I'm old, exactly. <laughs> and give seminars, workshop, and teacher training courses for practicing teachers all over the world, and is also involved in materials development for both print and online delivery. And he's also the author and co-author of some best-selling books like Going Mobile, Digital Literacies, and How to Teach English with Technology and many others. The one, How to Teach English, I have it on my bookshelf. Okay. So I've known it for quite, quite a while. Okay, so um, thank you to everybody who sent the questions. Most of them I incorporated uh, in my list. Yeah, and so then let's start talking. Okay. Yeah, well, I think I'm, I'm not alone in this feeling that technologies develop and change so quickly that it's almost impossible and maybe even not necessary to try to keep up with them. And well, yeah, after some time, I realized that it's still necessary to try to keep up because for example, I teach only online now, uh, but still there are so many of them that you just simply feel lost and overwhelmed. Yeah. So for someone whose technological savvy ends around Skype, Zoom and Quizlet, mm -hmm. can you give a short, a very, very short overview of the latest developments? <laughs> That's such a big question. I and, know, I know, it's and, very, very I'm wide. I'm anxious that you said short in the answer, give a short mm -hmm. answer. Um, I think the first thing is that um, it's actually impossible for anyone to keep up these days. I think there was a point, you know, I mean, I've been working in this, in the technology area since I think about 1994. So, um, and, and I a think- veteran. Early, well, early computers, basically. I mean, early kind of home computers. And mm -hmm. things. Um, and I think for a long time it was quite easy to keep up because things weren't moving very quickly. But um, the last, I guess, 15 years maybe, you know, since the internet really took off and things like sh sharing sites and all these kind of things and mobile apps, um, the pace of development is so quick now that it's actually impossible to keep up. So I think the first thing to say is, don't worry. <laughs> If you can't keep up, then you can't keep up, and that's fine. In, in a sense, if you don't know what you're missing, it doesn't really matter, I don't think. <laughs> that makes but, sense. Um, you know, I, I gave up Twitter a long, long time ago, but there was a, the, the thing about Twitter is it's, it's impossible to keep up with everything that's happening on Twitter. So I think in the end, you either have to stop using it or stop worrying, one of the two. My feeling with technology is just stop worrying. Um, you mentioned three tools, Skype, Zoom, and Quizlet. I mean, they're fabulous tools, all of them. Um, and if you're teaching, or you said you were teaching online, then obviously things like Skype and Zoom are going to be perfect for you. And in a way, Quizlet, I guess, if you're testing a certain kind of learning, then Quizlet's, Quizlet's fabulous. So I think we find, we often find the tools that we need. And we do that by talking to other people, I think, going to workshops, conferences and things like that. Every time I go to a conference, I learn about a tool that I never heard of. And sometimes they're great, sometimes I don't think they're good at all. So I kind of make a note of the good ones and I don't worry about the other ones. Um, in terms of what's coming, I think we're kind of lucky at the moment because the pace of development has slowed considerably. Slow. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the last two or three years, I think we went through a big period. We had um, the internet, then we had uh, electronic whiteboards, interactive whiteboards, then we had all the, the social media, sharing sites like YouTube and things. We've had a period of incredible speed of development, but things have slowed down. 
And if you look, if you keep an eye online, we don't see so many new types of tools coming along. For a while, people thought of new things, you know, like a, <clears throat> a version of the post-it note online. And, you know, all these ideas were taken from kind of normal life, if you can call it that, <laughs> into kind of electronic. It was like adopted into online. I think that's what, what happened over that period. A lot of things, I mean, there were some new things too, but mostly we saw people thinking, I wonder if I can do that technologically and coming up with an answer. Um, <clears throat> but the last two or three years, things have slowed down. I think the reason they've slowed down <clears throat> is that um, not so many, it's not about the tools, but not so many technologies are being developed. And the reason why that is happening is that mobile devices have pretty much captured the technology world. So if you look anywhere in the world, the one thing you will notice is that everyone, if they can afford it, has a mobile phone. But not very many people have interactive whiteboards in their homes. And not many people have uh, VR helmets and these kind of things. Um, because they're expensive, they don't do very much. Um, and we, and we, we get very excited about these things. And I know I have over the years. I got very excited about certain things. Second Life, which was a kind of online world. I was very yeah. excited about that for years. <laughs> I, I got briefly excited by VR until I actually sat down and tried it for more than about five minutes. Um, uh -huh, so you were disappointed? I, I, at the moment, I think VR is pretty much useless um, mm -hmm. for, for all sorts of reasons. I mean, there are lots of primary reasons and some of those are important. Financially, it's not very cheap. Um, the technology is not brilliant, I don't think, at the moment. If you, someone like me, you wear glasses, it's kind of quite uncomfortable at the moment. They're pretty heavy. Yeah, I mean, I've got one somewhere. Where is it? Just under my desk. There it is. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, they're not comfortable to wear these things at all. Um, and for for language learning, they they seem very counterintuitive to me. The thing, one of the basic things we know about language learning is. Um, that you get better at it the more you kind of interact with people and communicate with people. And actually, if you're sitting with one of these on, it's kind of hard to interact with someone. Um, yeah, so, it's not much about communication, right? No, not at all. I think a lot of these things and, and AI, you know, we these are big buzzwords and they're buzzwords in lots of other places, business, you know, business and finance and things, they need artificial intelligence in order to, um, go, get through a lot of data each day, but we're not really in the data business in language teaching. We're mm -hmm. kind of in the communication business, and that's very different, I think. So I think a lot of these tools, they kind of sound exciting and revolutionary and stuff, but actually they're not really. And uh, I did a talk at IATEFL this year in, in which I specifically looked at um, AI, AR, augmented reality, and, and VR. Um, and I came to the conclusion that actually they, they're pretty useless, all three of those. What we need, I think what teachers need are things that make our lives either easier or our teaching more effective, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, I, I, you know, um, we'll probably come on to that, the, the, the effectiveness of technology. But I don't think that worrying about the big developments in technology is necessarily what a teacher should be doing. That wasn't brief. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that, that makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you. And as, as we mentioned now, um, artificial intelligence. Yeah. So again, there are these, I don't know, rumors, fears that one day the artificial intelligence will um, remove all the teachers and everybody going to learn with the computers, uh, with this uh, robots, call them whatever. Yeah. What, what would you say to these fears? <laughs> and, and teachers have been worried about being replaced for a long time. Yeah, long yeah, yeah. By... As, as, as many professions made Absolutely. out, like taxi drivers, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So we, so we do see technology re replacing or at least changing jobs and um, taxi driver is, is one case in point, particularly somewhere like London where for years, the black cabs was it was an incredibly um, valued profession because in order to get a license to drive a black cab, you had to do this incredibly complex thing called the knowledge. The knowledge, yeah. <laughs> and that involved basically you could see these guys, mostly guys, 
um, driving around London on little scooters with maps pinned to the dashboard and they had to be able to learn every street and every street where the road works were happening, where roads were closed temporarily. And of course, technology's done away with that to an extent because Google Maps does all that for us now. You know, it doesn't matter whether you live in London or Moscow or St. Petersburg or wherever, Google Maps will tell you where the bad traffic is. So a lot of that's happened, but, um, but, but fortunately for us in the language learning game is that language is probably one of the most complex things. And it's also one of the things that we've, so far we've been unable to adequately describe to machines. So we don't know really how to explain language to machines. Um, there's a great a friend of mine who blogs on technology called Philip Kerr. And um, he's done a quite a, he's blogged quite a lot about artificial intelligence and he talks about this domain knowledge model. So for certain subjects, you can accurately describe those subjects and what they what they are and what they do and how they work. But for language, we don't have a complete domain knowledge model. So we, we don't know. We don't know how to describe language properly. Yeah, um, yeah. sorry for interrupting, just uh, strikes a chord. I read the book by Yuval Noah Harari, uh -huh. and he mentioned that a lot, a lot of professions, a lot of things that we do, they are algorithms. So yeah. they are particular yeah. algorithms. And uh, what you are saying now is that I'm thinking that it's, it's almost impossible to put teaching into a particular algorithm. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, when uh, there are certain languages which are easier to describe. I'm, I'm a, um, a Spanish and Catalan speaker. I lived in Spain for many, many years. Uh, and um, Spanish probably has more logic to it than English. But there still comes a point in the Spanish language where you go beyond the logic of putting words together to idiomatic expression, and all these kind of extra things, paralinguistic things of, of understanding someone by just looking at them, you know, because all, all of those visual cues and things, these are things that are very tricky to teach to machines. So we do, we, we're, at the moment we're in a, a place where machines understand simple language. You, you know, I've got one of those annoying Alexa things. And it understands a certain amount of things. I can say Alexa. It's this uh, Amazon tool. Yeah, a little box that you talk to. Yeah. I don't talk to mine because I find it weird talking to machines. Yeah. <laughs> In Russia, we have Alisa, like Alice. Well, there you go. So you've got those, and, 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 and they appear to understand language, but they don't really. What they understand is, is certain keywords and things like that. So, and, and they understand. You notice if you buy one of these machines, they, they give you a list of things that you can say to them because they know that if you kind of, um, if you go off piste, and start talking randomly at them, then they're, they're simply not going to understand because they don't have that understanding of language. So to go back to the question, I, I think anybody who, <laughs> it's really hard to make predictions with this because computing power gets better and better all the time. But I think until we can accurately describe language in its entirety, teachers are probably very, very safe. And we have a famous, there's a famous um, translation test for computers. And it's a sentence which is, <clears throat> time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. Okay, a sentence that has the same, uh, uh, same halves in terms of- Yes, yeah, so it's like but, syntactically, it's, it's But it's a totally same, different but, meaning. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we know, it, we, it, we may take a few seconds to kind of compute the trickery in that sentence, well, yeah. but a computer just simply can't understand it. Mm -hmm. Unless it's explicitly taught that sentence. And apart from anything else, you cannot go along to Alexa or Elisa and say, I'm having a problem with the present perfect, can you explain it to me? Because they can't do it. So we're probably safe for quite some time. I, I, I mean, I, like I say, difficult to guess. I would say anyone over 35 is probably safe with extended <laughs> period. Under 35, who knows? I, it's difficult to know what's gonna happen in the next 20 years. But at the moment, I think it's a very safe profession. And, sorry, apart from anything else, 
if you take the humans out of it, it kind of doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> because most people learn a language because they have a need to communicate for whatever reason. They've fallen in love with someone from another country. They're going to work there. They're going to go on business there four, five, six, ten times a year. Um, you know, we t uh, uh, some people learn languages for hobbies, of course, as well. But the ultimate aim of learning a language is to go and talk to someone, I think, yeah. most people, you know. Um, so machines don't really fit into that, I don't think. No, okay. I think we're, I think we're okay. Yeah. Thank you. So that's good news. You know, I just recently, like a week ago, I turned 35. And when you say that... Oh, right. I'm sorry. Okay, well, maybe... Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's exactly good news. Yeah, so I'm, I'm 35, so I know that, that I'm don't, safe. Yeah. Don't hold me to that prediction. You know <laughs> okay. I'm, just, I'm just kidding, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, surely uh, the message is, uh, is pretty clear. And yeah. actually, you know, like intuitively, I had, I had the same feeling, you know, even after reading Harari, who says mm -hmm. that, well, most of the professions will die out sooner or later. Yeah, I still, I still believe that teaching will, will hold for a while at least. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Yeah. yeah. Um, one more fear that is like closer to our reality. So some teachers wonder uh, whether face-to-face -face lessons will be replaced by online ones in the nearest future. What do you think about it? Um. Okay, so we are seeing quite a bit of change there. I know there are, there are quite a few um, companies that have been set up. I'm sure you have them in Russia. We certainly have them in the UK, which offer online classes. I was involved in a startup company in Barcelona when I lived there, uh, which launched in 1999, which was called Net Languages, which was an online language school. So it's not a new thing. Um, but I guess there are certain reasons why people now prefer them uh, more than, than then. We, the technology is here, the connectivity is here, but mostly I guess it's about time for a lot of people, about the ability. Um, I'm just thinking about Moscow, because Moscow is the city I know probably best in Russia, because I've been there so many times. You know, why would you want to sit in a traffic jam for two hours to go to a language school? and have an hour and a half class and then sit in a traffic jam for another two hours to get home if you could do it from the comfort of your own home it, it kind of doesn't make sense really um so i think lots of people kind of like the idea they're also they can be very cheap as well because there are huge organizations of teachers who are based in countries like the philippines and vietnam and parts of latin america who are able to offer online courses, classes much more cheaply than I could teach them. Because if I taught at that rate, I wouldn't be able to live, you know, I wouldn't be able to pay my bills. So it's kind of, it's a very competitive market. There's lots of offer. You could easily find a good, cheap teacher, if that's what you want. Um, you get the flexibility. And all sorts of other things. So, so there are lots of good reasons why you might want to study online, but there, I think there are an equal amount of good reasons why you might not want to. Because, well, let's think about women in particular. There's a, there's a great thing about women and, and online and face-to-face -face things, um, which, which I always find interesting. And that is that, that often women prefer face-to-face -face professional development rather than online professional development, because if they go to face-to-face -face professional development, they're not surrounded by distractions at home. Uh, usually women, not, not always, but usually women, they're not surrounded by kids saying, where are my shoes, by people going, what are we having for dinner, or did anyone do the shopping, and all those kind of things. If you're at home trying to do online professional development, watching a webinar, and your kid comes in and says, I've fallen over and hurt me, you're going to go and look, look after them. If you're away at a professional development thing, you can't do that. So you're much more in the moment. So yeah, I think there's, right. there's a good reason why people want to go to classes, and that is because it's a controlled space. It's often a relief from something else a relief from work, you know, getting out of work, being able to say to the boss, my phone's going to be off for the next two hours because I'm in my English class that you want me to do, you know? 
Um, and, and also, I think that there is the social aspect. I, I, um, we're going to talk about the social aspect, I hope, a little bit more about online. Mm -hmm. But um, there is the social aspect, uh, aspect of getting together with people. I think of, of sitting in a room, um, chatting before the class, chatting after class, going for a beer and a pizza sometimes. All of those things make face-to-face -face learning a, a different experience. Now, I'm a big fan of both, so I'm not, you know, I, I recognise that there are strengths and weaknesses to, to both of them, I think. Um, not always the obvious ones. I love going and sitting in a room and interacting with people, but I equally, you know, I'm, I'm equally happy watching a, a webinar or um, an online presentation. I think it kind of depends on the day, really, and how you feel. And mm -hmm. uh, if, I know if I go and sit in a room, I'm less likely to kind of doze off or be distracted or, you know, I mean, sometimes I've put a webinar on and then gone and cooked dinner thinking that I'm actually watching the webinar when clearly I'm not, I'm actually cooking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the concentration is probably the key here and when, when you were saying that I really realized why I love face-to-face uh, -face training uh, yeah. even though I teach online all the time and I did also a lot of online uh, learning as well so I did my Delta online. Right. right. The first two modules, I mean, yeah, both work but in different modes, you know, yeah, yeah. different who, who did, uh, did, So you did, and, and module three you did? Uh, well, I'm, I'm doing module three now, but my module two was also with Niall, with this okay. distance part-time, so I also did a lot of things online. So yeah, apart yeah. only from, from the lessons that I taught in, in class. I think it's kind of interesting to have that experience. I always say that, that people who teach online should always be students online before they teach online. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting to see what you do like and what you don't like yeah, about being a student online before you become a teacher online, you know? Yeah. All right, let's move on to some more practical things, yeah? Because we, we, we spoke about quite abstract things so yeah, far. Um, and there are a couple of questions from subscribers that um, ask you for some advice, yeah? Uh, well, again, now it's, it's a bit more general question. If you can explain something to your students easier and quicker face to face without using any te technology, then do it. Yeah. So this is an opinion. Do uh -huh. you agree with that? Is there a limit, uh, and should it exist? Okay. So um, if you can explain something to your students easier and quicker face to face without using technology, do it. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. Um, it does. Look. Um, I, I. I suppose. If we really want to break down the question, then I guess we'd look at easier and quicker. Mm -hmm. um, because easier and quicker don't necessarily mean better or deep, you know, as deep learning. Mm -hmm. like. So I think, I mean, we'd have to look at those two words a little bit uh, carefully. But, but there is a good core of, of, of um, common sense in there. And that is, I've, I've seen over the years, I've watched lots of teachers using technology. Um, loads of brilliant activities and great things, but I've also seen teachers spend half an hour explaining a technology to students and then them using the technology for five minutes. And clearly that was a waste of time, you know, and, and effort. Um, I'm always reminded with the, the easier and quicker, I'm reminded many years ago when I first moved to Spain as an English teacher, it was in the days when we weren't, we were told very explicitly as teachers that we were not allowed to use the student's first language. So even though I spoke Spanish, I wasn't allowed to use Spanish in the classroom. Everything had to be in English all the time. And the, um, the two owners of the school that I worked for, they were very, very strict about this. And um, I always remember I had to, there was an item of vocabulary. I can't for the life of me think what the word was. Let's imagine it was, I don't know, badger or something. And someone said, what does badger mean? Now, I could have translated that in 1.5 seconds, but I wasn't allowed to. <laughs> and I can't draw, so I couldn't draw one. Um, you know, and, and so what do you do? 
what, what and whose time am I wasting? And what's the what's the purpose of that activity? That's right. I'm trying to explain. You know, it's a it's an animal. It's black and white. It, you know, and they're going a panda. And I go, no, it's not a panda. It's a smaller. And we, this goes on. For, you know, two three minutes. I'm trying to mime a badger. How does one mime a badger? I don't know. Um, so so there we are. We're all wasting time uh, for no apparent reason. I think that. That applies to technology too. Is if you're wasting time with it, and I think that that was the thrust of the question. Um, if it takes too much effort, then don't do it. You know, if you can achieve the same thing with a piece of paper and a pencil, use the paper and pencil. Brilliant. Um, I don't have an issue with that. What I do have a little issue with, I think, is a teacher who perhaps says I can do everything better and easier and quicker, non-technologically because I don't think you can these days for very good reasons. I think, you know, um, most, of our, most of our students who, who come through primary, secondary, and maybe private language schools, um, they are going into a workplace that's changed. I'm not gonna claim it's all magically technological, but it has changed. And it has changed in a variety of ways. You know, there's less, there's less handwriting and more keyboard writing that's a skill um, there's less emphasis on having a good CV and more emphasis on having a good profile on LinkedIn or whatever you know whichever social network mm -hmm. you, you want to use <clears throat> that's a language school too we used to teach CVs we should be teaching profiles same thing mm -hmm. um, I don't think we should be spending a lot of time teaching formal and informal letter writing because I can't remember the last time I wrote either of those things. We should be looking at the genre of email as a language thing. So there are lots of things that, you, that technology is absolutely necessary for, I think. It's not necessary for lots of traditional activities, but it can enhance lots of traditional activities. I, I, I mean, I could go on for hours on this subject because it's kind of, it's sort of the center of the technology mm -hmm. argument, really, I mm -hmm. think, is what's it all for? And I think what's it for, what it's for, and primarily these days with mobile phones, is that it allows students to start things outside in the real world and bring them into class to finish or work on. I'll give you an example in a second. Mm -hmm. Or it allows students to start something in class and take it outside into the real world with them. Now, an example of that could be something very mundane, like next week we're starting a, a unit on transport. What I'd like you to do is, when you're wandering around the city at the weekend, take five photographs of different forms of transport, means of transport, and bring them to class. It's a very simple activity. It's not revolutionary at all. <clears throat> Why does it work? Well, it works, I think, because, excuse me, <clears throat> because people take photographs all the time. So it's a, na it's a natural thing to do. Um, it works because it's vocabulary that they've chosen, that they've photographed, that they bring in with them. We've got the whole ownership thing. Mm, it's uh, personalized. Whole, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's personalized. It's a personal investment. They bring it in. You, now, you, once, once all that vocabulary comes into class, you're probably going to do some very traditional things with it choose the words you want to keep and the ones you don't want to keep, do some vocabulary activities. But that's where technology really works. And I think for, for many years, I think students have struggled to, to make a connection between what happens in their classes and what happens in the real world. You know, traditionally, I think they've been very separate quite often mm -hmm. and I think so mobiles they, they allow like I say they allow people to make that smooth transition from normal life to, to, to class life um, and I think using those kind of devices even with those simple activities like photographing vocabulary um, it makes people feel like they're doing something normal you know, something you know that their, that their language activities actually fit with their lives you know and so I think there's a lot of stuff you can do um, to, to make activities more interesting, more personalized, more meaningful. So I suppose to go back, the reason why I w was worried a little bit about the two words easier and quicker is yeah. mm -hmm. it's not necessarily better to do things more quickly or that's to fine. go, that's easier. What we need to do, I suppose, with all tasks or, or everything that we ask students to do is to 
examine the, the, the efficacy of that task. Does it do what we want it to do well and efficiently? That's good. There are other things like, is it motivating? Is it fun? I mean, all of those things need to be taken into account. But I, but I guess for me, I suppose I wouldn't start from easy and quick. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah efficacy, efficiency, that's, uh, that's probably more important. To we consider. want things to work, don't we? You know, as teachers, right. we want things to work. We want people to remember things. Right, and I just I just remembered um, one of my conversations, interviews with Hugh Deller, and he also said that you don't have to use technology just to feel that you use technology. No, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. You yeah. know, as a big technology fan, I often go into into training sessions and teaching sessions without any technology. I mean, I'll always have my phone with me because at some point, someone's going to say, "What does Badger mean?" and I'm going to say, "Look it up in Google Images." You know rather yeah. than spending 10 yeah. minutes to explain it. But um, no, uh, there's no point using it just for the sake of using it. I think if you're going to use technology, you've got to have a clear rationale in your head of why you're doing it. You know? yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's move on. And there was a question about error correction. Uh -huh. uh, how much time do you feel should be dedicated to face-to-face -to -face or technology-supported feedback and error correction? What should be the share of oral feedback in class, mistake correction, and discussions versus correction, and comments with feedback made online? So uh, I guess that uh, the person who asked this question, so they meant sort of blended learning uh, context, yeah? So what do you think, where should be this balance between? Wow, <laughs> that's another really complex question. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, com <laughs> it's complex because before you decide whether uh, how much face-to-face -face or technology supported feedback you're doing you've got to decide on how much feedback you're doing which you're is doing, kind of doing it all yeah <laughs> which is the first thing yeah uh, uh, you know and, and, and everyone has their ideas <clears throat> on the, the amount of correction and feedback uh, clearly feedback's very different from correction my feeling has always been with with and 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 it's probably even a greater feeling now is it for me, it depends on why people are learning languages or what their aim is as to how much correction and feedback they need. And I think everyone's different in that sense. Someone who's going to, someone who's coming to do a basic course in English because they've fallen in love with, with, you know, a woman from England or Canada or something, they're not going to need that much correction. What they really need to do is to be able to talk. The Communication, correction, yeah. Mm -hmm. The correction will be provided by someone else, you know, over time. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, people who are going to do an exam, of course, need a level of correction which is totally unreasonable and, 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 and stupid, in my humble opinion. But that is what we live with. Um, you know, people. Yeah. Pass exam. In Russia, it's it's you know it's such a strong tradition now, particularly in the Russian state exam, to you know to just correct everything. Yeah, I, I think I mean, it's kind of it's it's uh, what, you, what it's a vicious circle now. It's not just Russia; it's many countries. I think mm -hmm. you know that. Um, students grow up expecting every every error to be pointed out and corrected and stuff like that and um i you you can't really i mean you have to break that cycle somehow because ultimately a hundred percent perfection is only really necessary to get a great a hundred percent grade in an exam and it would actually be very hard to find in the average native if we use that term speaker that people are not 100 percent correct all the time it's a i mean i, I it's a un, an unrealistic aim for anyone yeah. native mm -hmm. non-native born you know whatever um in terms of how correction works i think there's a there's a, a great colleague of mine and friend russell stannard does a lot of fabulous um work in technology mediated feedback so uh, first, I'd recommend looking at his excuse me, <coughs> looking at his work because it, he, mm -hmm. he's, you get much more an in-depth answer by looking at his work and the articles he's written. Is it on his website, right? Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. and you know, he's won awards for the work he's done in this field, um, and he's got some really interesting techniques in terms of taking students' written work in Word 
and recording a screen video of him highlighting things and talking about them and offering suggestions. And I like, I, I do like that kind of feedback and, and his research showed that students respond very favorably to it uh, because they know that they're getting personal feedback when they can hear the person speaking. Uh, and they also know that the person has to perhaps take a little, make a little bit more effort than they might do if they were scribbling with a red pen on a piece of written work, mm -hmm. which can be done very quickly and carelessly. So you, you mean to, to record a feedback with your voice? So he's basically, yeah, he, 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 record, he, he would put, he, he displays the student's written work in Word on the screen. Mm -hmm. And then he does a screen recording of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. of what saying. So here you've written da da da. Do you think there's a better way of expressing? Mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. And it's lovely, it's a really lovely way of doing feedback. I, I, I like that immensely. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it and I do it as well. And I think mm -hmm. you probably found that I've done it too. The students really respond favorably to it because it does mm -hmm. feel personalized and, and, you know, like the teachers actually read your stuff, which yeah. I, I think um, we often with red pens, it's kind of easier to put a, it's easy to put a word missing or a question mark or something, but it doesn't feel in a way the, the video makes it feel like you've actually sat there and thought about it, you know, as a teacher. That's right. Um, so I do like that kind of feedback. Um, I think face-to-face -face feedback is more transactional. You know, people get to say, I get to say as a teacher, I see you put this, why did you put that? The student goes, well, I put that because, and then I go, okay, I can see, blah, blah, blah. So you do get perhaps, you know, a more transactional uh, dialogue, a more of a conversation which may be more formative. It kind of depends on the quality of the feedback. At the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. One thing I will say just related to feedback, and this has happened quite a few times in, in activities I know, is that um, often feedback and assessment, when, when people are working with technology, um, teachers insist on doing heavy error correction, feedback and assessment on technology related activities too. And that can often be very kind of detrimental and have a negative effect on what's happening. I'll give you a concrete example. I know of a teacher who was doing, he had a class of mid-teens, 15, 16, they would never write anything at all, nothing at all. And he for some reason, he was doing uh, some work with them in poetry and they, they really enjoyed the poetry. And they started writing poems and he was putting them on a blog and they, you know, people were liking them, going along and leaving comments. And this went on for quite some time. And then he, he came up with this plan. He thought, well, they're doing all this amazing writing. What else I'll do is I'll mark the poems instead. And of course, as soon as he started marking the poems, they stopped writing them. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, feedback, feedback and assessment are, are tricky. We need to look at why we do them um, and what purpose they serve. If they are truly formative activities, then fabulous. If they inhibit people from doing something that they naturally do, you take a great community. I, I know lots of people who have really basic English, but they can talk oh. and talk and talk. My sister. For hours. My sister's a absolutely top-notch fluent speaker of French and German and she can live in France for years and no one knows that she's not French. Her Spanish, she speaks Spanish at a very low level with a French accent <laughs> but, but she used to come and visit me in Spain and I would go, I'd leave her on a terrace with Spanish people while I went to cook some food and when I came back they would have had like half an hour's conversation about the education system in France and Spain. Some people communicate and if you go in there and start saying you should have used a present perfect there, they stop communicating. So, you know, and to, for, for me, it's not about whether we do it online or face to face or blended. It's, it's why we do it. You know, uh, a mix is fine. A mix is fine. But, but yeah. first, I, I think we need to take a serious look at yeah. correction, feedback and assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question was related to. Um, online context okay. yeah uh, fully online and with a lot of asynchronous work and 
I need to explain what is asynchronous for those who are going to watch us. So synchronous is when you have live sessions and live lessons okay. with uh, your tutor. Yeah, and asynchronous when you have tasks and uh, do them on your own in your own time. And uh, yeah, so in this case, when there are a lot of asynchronous uh, tasks, uh, the question of motivation comes up because students don't have to go to class, they work on their own, usually online from home, and um, not everybody's good at uh, time management. Yeah? So which tools can help them to stay motivated? Now, this is actually, I think, um, I, I, I love this question for so many, many reasons, because this is the, when, when, when I started my company in 2003 in Spain, the first thing we ever ran was a course on e-moderation, on being an online tutor. And we've now been running that course for 16 years. And Lindsay Clanfield is your tutor, right? Uh, Lindsay works for us, yeah, yeah, he's a fabulous tutor. Yeah, we, we That's have the one I really want to take. <laughs> <laughs> so we have loads of great people who work with us on that course. And that course has changed and evolved over the last 16 years, but actually it's still basically the same course it was 16 years ago. Um, and there are lots of reasons behind that. Now, that course is probably 90% asynchronous, okay? There are probably, in the four weeks, there are probably two synchronous online sessions. The rest is offline. So you would think that that would fit into all these possible issues here of motivation and time management and all those kind of things, but it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because I think that the, the the problem in the question, maybe, or the, the, the problematic word is tools. I think it's tools is kind of if you want to kill a conversation with someone who loves technology and really believes in the transformational power of technology, use the word tools because tools are completely the wrong way of going about technology and online courses. It's never, ever, ever about the tools. All it is is about the tasks, like any good teaching is. It's about the task. Now, the person to look up here, I've mentioned a person in each of these questions. The person to look up here is a woman called Jilly Salmon, who wrote a fabulous book called um, E-Moderation, a long, long time ago. I think it's in its fourth or fifth edition now. And she was probably one of the first people to describe really how an online course works and what's needed to make it successful. And the, the primary thing in, to make an online course successful, if, if it, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, is you've got to do the work that you do in a face-to-face -face course right at the beginning. You've got, in a face-to-face -face course, we make sure that people know where the school is, that they know where the classroom is, that they know where their teacher is, that they, you know, they sit down somewhere, that they've got their pens and papers. Um, they know all those things. We spend a little bit of time getting to know them. And we spend a little bit of time allowing them to get to know each other. We do all these things without even thinking about them face to face. Those things happen. That's what we do on the first day. We get people in, we get them comfortable, we get them to talk to each other, we find out about them, and then we start teaching. And an online course is exactly the same. And if you don't do that at the beginning of an online course, you'll never have a successful online course. And the reason why a lot of online courses fail primarily I think is because they don't do this socialization thing at the beginning and it's not just about doing it at the beginning you then have to consolidate and you do this by introducing people over the period of the course to a variety of tasks with a variety of interaction types we start off with individual tasks you do pair work tasks you do small group tasks you do big group tasks you do whole group tasks exactly like you would in a face-to-face -face group so what happens then is that people not only do they they figure out that they're actually dealing with other real human beings uh, but they also they develop a sense of shared responsibility you know that task will fail if i don't do my bit because this is a group of three tasks um so i you you don't need i don't think you need progress bars and things like that what you really need is you need well-designed tasks tasks that get people in make them comfortable help them work together help them figure out 
the meaning of stuff and, and build some learning together and come out of the end feeling very happy that they've learned something. I don't think it's rocket science, but, but, but the most important thing is that beginning thing. If you don't do the socialization and stuff, the rest of it just won't work. So motivation, how do people stay motivated? We know quite a lot about online courses and motivation. One of the things is that the longer an online course goes on, the, the, the less motivated people are. But actually that shouldn't really surprise us because that often happens in face-to-face -face courses as well. Where people drop off after a while. We know that if people pay for their own courses, they're often more highly motivated than if someone else Somebody pays else, yeah. for them, you know? <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm thinking about the courses that my company runs is that most people on our courses pay for themselves. They decide to do the courses themselves, uh, you know, and they're short. And our drop off rate, I, I suspect over the last 16 years is is under 5%. We very rarely get anyone who doesn't finish a course because they're short. They're busy and people are invested in them. They decide to do them. They pay for them. You know, um, the, the problem with online courses comes, I think, when people are forced into them, they go on too long, they're dull. Or if they're, if they're doing an online course that actually isn't an online course, it's just a collection of PDFs to read. Random tasks. Random tasks, random readings, the odd exercise, and no kind of idea of a coherent kind of journey from beginning to end. So I think I think a lot of things a lot of things about measuring and keeping people motivated and stuff like that they come down basically to the two things that we know face to face or two of the things we know face to face training comes down to well designed tasks and good tutors and they'll get you through anything I think or they should do. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. So um, now we're going to move on to our last part. Okay. And we're going to talk about uh, some other worries of um, <laughs> teachers about, you know, like short attention span, you know, constantly oh, yeah, pushing yeah. on and off. <laughs> but first, I'm going to ask you about digital literacy. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is a very good reason why I decided to ask you. So first of all, you wrote a book on digital literacy. Indeed. And the reason why I'm asking <laughs> uh, uh, about it is uh, because this word has become a sort of trauma in Russia a year ago uh, because of our Russian state exam and uh, a year ago candidates had to write an essay on digital literacy in modern world the tragedy was that not only a lot of teenage candidates didn't know what it is but most of the raters who are school uh, teachers uh -huh. didn't know it either yeah and the result was a real disaster as many school leavers got a fail on essays and reportedly uh, some of the raters argued that digital literacy is the ability to handle household appliances uh -huh. Yeah. So and after that, you know, like digital literacy has become a word that um, uh, emanates fear for people. So once and for all, could you please explain what digital literacy is and what it's not? Okay. Well, it, it's it's not about using the toaster machine at home. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> to um, start with. <laughs> I, I, that's a, that's um. I I I know it's a painful story, but I, it's also a kind of a funny story. I think because um. Basically, you're asking people to answer a question that they've had no information about, really. So I'm not surprised it was uh, traumatic for everyone involved, because actually uh, reading the answers must have been as traumatic as trying to write one. Um, the, the thing is, <laughs> well, just before we look at what it is and what it isn't, this this term. I mean, you'll find this term and other terms similar. So, I mean, it depends where you go in the world. You you can read about digital literacy. You'll also read about 21st century skills and digital skills and all sorts of other things. And what they are, all of those titles are a not very useful way of describing a set of skills that that are helpful to people in their normal daily lives and therefore should be helpful to people in their professional lives. Digital literacy, I think, is the ability to survive and thrive 
in a world that has been totally and utterly changed by technology in the last 10, 15 years, more than any other time. You know, technology's changed the world many times, the printing press, television, radio. But this has been a, a, a revolution of, of such massive proportions. It, it's, it's made the world at the same time both incredibly small and, and incredibly big, you know. Um, we all know what everyone else is doing. We know things that we never knew before. We know about climate change. We know about how these things are affecting the world. All of these things we know about, um, you know, that we all suffer from these in, in, in all of the countries that we've been talking about. Uh, this idea of fake news, of the manipulation of media, of, you know, photographic manipulation and video manipulation and all of these things. Uh, these are things that when I went to school, were not things that we had to worry about. You know, all I had to worry about was getting to four o'clock, getting on my bike and cycling around for three hours, having my dinner and going to bed. You know, that was it. Um, but people coming through now, coming through our education system now, they, they must acquire those skills because they're, they're kind of fundamental and, and will be increasingly fundamental to every bit of life. You know, we need to be able to use our email and use our chat programs and whatsapp and all these kind of things we need to be able to i spoke before about creating digital profiles um sending emails um we need to be able to cast a critical eye on everything we see that has had contact with technology every photograph every video every news story every social media post we need to have the skills to be able to look at them in an analytical way and say i believe that or i don't believe that or this is useful to me this isn't useful to me so i think digital literacy is really it is all about navigating what is now just an increasingly complex world if i mean you can you can take all that out if you talk i mean hugh and i um, hugh's a big friend of mine um hugh and i have argued many times about what actually happens in, a, in an english classroom and, and his opinion is that, that an English classroom is about the English language and mine's slightly different. I'm sure he'll be in touch now saying that I'm, I'm misquoting him. Um, and I've always said that, that one, we should bring things like technology into the classroom because they're outside the classroom. And, and I've said earlier when we were talking about mobiles, I think that, that people do need to see a, a connection between the inside and the outside. And digital literacy is one way of doing that, I think, one way of exploring the world in a language class. So when Nikki and Mark and I wrote the book about digital literacies, we tried to put together a set of practical activities that had both a language focus, so there was something to learn or practice, could be a lexical set or a grammar point or whatever, um, but there was also a digital literacy focus. So the teacher could do an activity that had a clear language focus, but they could also say, okay, what we've done today is this you know we've looked at i don't know we've looked at fake websites and we've learned how to distinguish a real website from a fake website and that's a skill and it's a skill that's needed because i don't know about russia because obviously i don't follow the media so closely in russia but i do know in england uh, uh in the uk that people just put things online now and they become true you know. Yeah, well, it's 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 the same, or probably even worse. <laughs> well, who knows? I, I don't think I don't think we need to get into a competition about which country is worse, right? That's right. Um, but so so yeah, that, that's a, a long way round of saying I think digital literacy is just it's just basic sub digital survival skills, you know. And hey, if you live in the middle of I don't know, if you I don't know, live in the middle of uh, Siberia, and you're going to be a you're going to work in the logging industry. Maybe you don't need loads of digital literacies, but you, you're probably going to need some. You might be keeping in touch with family. You might even be selling wood, in which case you're going to want the literacies to know how much you should be getting for your wood, where the best place to sell it is, all those kind of things. So I think it's not about learning a finite. You can't say, look, there are 30 things you need to know. What you can say, I think, is that everyone needs a certain level of literacy in order to survive and that goes right down to to um you know some of the more 
kind of manual things like farming and stuff like that. We know this to be true. In India, people used to have to sell their products to the, the buyer nearest where they lived, and the buyer would set the price. And they couldn't find out whether that was a good price or a bad price. But now people know what their products are worth. And so having that literacy of being able to go online and find out what your product and product you've grown is worth is clearly a really good skill to have. Um, so it, it's complex. I think it, it depends where you live and the context you live in and what you're going to be doing and all sorts of things. But we do know, I think, you know, prior to digital, we had what, what in England we call the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Those were our literacies of the day, you know, um, literacy and numeracy. And really mm -hmm. for, anyone, for anyone to survive beyond a certain date in our history, they had to have those skills, you know, reading, writing, and, and basic mathematics. Mm -hmm. And I think digital literacy is just an extension of that. You've got to have those anyway, because without those, you can't do anything. A digital literacy is just another layer or level of it, yeah. mm -hmm. survival mm -hmm. and i'm just thinking you know uh, we, we sometimes make this division between digital natives and digital immigrants uh for whom do you think it's it's harder to acquire this digital literacy you know um i, I when mark prensky first came out with that terminology i think everyone thought wow that's amazing those those words are so fabulous. Digital, oh uh, yes, uh, uh, but but sadly, when when you dig deeper into the literature around that concept, I mean, you'll find that 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 concept was basically an ageist concept. It was basically young people brilliant, old people rubbish at technology. That was, I think, his mistake. Uh, also, those words are kind of quite highly charged. You know, immigrant is it's kind of a highly charged word in many ways. Mm -hmm. so you, you see that the, the discourse in technology has moved very much beyond that, and we see terms like digital resident and digital visitor. And those are kind visitor. of like, <laughs> and visitor, and they seem to be more kind of normal in many ways. You know, I'm, I'm clearly a digital resident, I spend most of my day uh, in front of a computer or a mobile doing stuff, but the mere fact of spending a lot of time with technology does not make you good at it and you can check any 14 year old to see that most 14 year olds will do four things maybe watch videos chat to friends maybe play a game listen to music but they won't do much more than that um, so for me it's it's less about well it's certainly not about age that's for sure. My dad is 87 now. He got his first computer when he retired at the age of 60 something. He went to night school. He learned how to use the computer and do Word and all that kind of stuff. Um, about 10 years ago, he moved to a laptop because he wanted to be able to sit down in the living room where it was warmer than upstairs in the cold bedroom. Uh, and about three years ago, he moved to a tablet and he's on Facebook. So it's, it's clearly not an age thing. What it is is yeah. an Thing. You know, my dad and my mum, when she was alive, they needed technology to keep in touch with me and my sister. My sister lives in France. I lived in Spain at the time. So they had a clear need to do something. And they also had the right attitude. Give it a go. See if it works. Where I think most teachers or a lot of teachers who don't use technology suffer from a, from a, a distinct lack of confidence, you know, uh, um, which is understandable. And a lack of training, which is also understandable because when people learn to be teachers, they don't get that training. So I don't think it is an age thing. Um, I think it it has been an age thing simply because it didn't exist when more mature people like me were young. You know, when I grew up, we had this, my school got the first computer when I left when the year I was leaving school. So there, it is an age thing, but only because of an accident of when technology was developed, really. Yeah. But mostly technology is not about being a native or an immigrant or a resident or a visitor. It's really about attitude. And I can, for every young teacher of 23 who's brilliant with technology, I can find you a dad like mine at 87 who's equally brilliant with technology because he wants to be. Yeah, thank you. That really makes sense and that that's sort of fairness, fairness uh because i also felt that 
um, yeah, so this emotionally laden word like immigrant and, and it's, it's a difficult it's, word these days, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So let's return to the social aspect that we've talked about, yeah? And uh, there was a question. Technology is drawing young learners and teens away from real world communication to online. And some uh, people speak now about seeming deterioration of their real world communication skills as a result of that. Should we teachers take any responsibility for that and try to combat the process? Or what can we do to both promote digital literacy and make sure that we're not contributing to uh, this deterioration of real life communication skills. Wow. I think you always get really good kind of quality questions from Russia. <laughs> I mean, they're always kind of like, they're complex and dense and they have a lot in them, don't they? Um, well, the, the first thing I think is, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Professor David Crystal, who is- Oh, uh, I love him. One of our most eminent, linguists in the UK and, and he's written quite a lot about technology over the years he wrote a great book about uh, the way language has changed called texting the great debate which is a yeah. fabulous book and he's written an awful lot about technology and this idea that um, technology means people aren't communicating anymore because it's kind of an interesting one his research showed that of course given the amount of text flowing in Facebook and tech, uh, WhatsApp and all that kind of thing. Most young people are reading and writing way, way more than they ever have, but way more, hundreds of percent more than they ever had. Um, so there's a lot of communication going that way. Um, they're also, contrary to popular belief, most of what they write is actually fairly standard English. It's not full of abbreviations and it's not all lol you know there's a, there's a lot of words in there um so the first thing to say i think is like like many other myths um technology isn't killing the art of conversation really it's, it's changing it slightly i think um in the same way that you know people often talk about motivation that, that technology's reduced people's uh, motivation and the only answer to that is to ask people to watch kids playing video games, you'll see how motivated they are. It's just that people are motivated. We know that people are motivated by things that they find enjoyable and engaging. And often classes aren't for all sorts of reasons. Some of them very, very understandable. Um, so communication, what are, what are kids not doing that they used to do? I don't think there is anything. Kids still talk, kids still play. Um, it's just that, they do things in different quantities perhaps than they used to do and that becomes noticeable and i was there, there are some things that keep coming up on social media there's a picture of some kids in an art gallery um in front of a very famous painting the nightwood <coughs> nightwood so you know that um, in the reichs museum oh yeah i, I and know they're all staring at the mobile phones and everyone's oh, shocking isn't it because these shocking children sitting in front of one of the most amazing paintings in the world and what are they doing staring at their mobile phones and of course you dig deeper and they're staring at their mobile phones because they're actually engaged in an activity which came from an app produced by the museum to yeah. help kids gain access to their paintings and you always see pictures people posting pictures of kids staring at their screen i yeah so sorry for interrupting. I, I absolutely love this story because i'm a regular visitor at Rijks museum i go museum. there every year yeah, yeah and i i know this story and you know just uh, again a week ago i was in Am amsterdam uh -huh. and i was exactly in the same situation so the internet uh, the wi-fi provided by the museum you know it's it like switched uh, switches off all the time and you know by coming to to painting you know i have to look at my mobile phone to find this this video uh from the guide yeah <laughs> i just realized that from the outside so somebody can take the picture and say the same about me yeah? oh yeah and yeah, that's yeah, yeah. so so that's really short-minded I love that you see these things of, uh, of kids staring at mobile phones and then uh, someone will inevitably post a photograph of people on a train in the 1950s in the UK. No one's talking to anyone. Every, each one of them has a newspaper in front of their face like this. You know, times change and things change. Um, kids, like I say, kids, we know kids read and write more than they used to. And that, that's a brilliant, brilliant thing. 
it's good that cannot be a bad thing um, we know that people still speak to each other uh, but we also know that that kids do what their parents do you know that kids learn from their parents and and there is still space for good and bad parenting you know and I, there's another fav favorite cartoon of mine which i love is it's a there's a woman and her son sitting next to each other on a park bench and the woman's reading a book and the son's reading a book and next to them there's a woman and a, a son and they're both looking at mobile phones and the woman with the mobile phone says to the woman with the book how do you get your son to read and the answer is obvious by setting a good example you know and i think um we do have a responsibility of parents and, and teachers to make sure that kids learn like everything else that 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 thing doing things in moderation is the way forward you know you don't need to stare at your mobile phone all day every day the world will still be you know it'll still exist there are good things to do without them speaking is great um this is not something that kids are born doing you know they learn that behavior and they learn it from us so i'm not worried for i'm not worried for young people at all they'll, they'll figure it all out uh, all i know is that they're producing more language than they ever have done and that's got to be a good that's thing. right yeah that's right you know? yeah and yeah this is a really great book by david crystal i also loved it yeah, yeah. Uh, great debate He's a great writer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so the very last question okay is also you know this about worries and fears by by teachers yeah so constant switching multitasking shorter attention span inability to concentrate on something for longer than a couple of minutes yeah? some teachers try to sort of prohibit mobile devices in their language in their language classes to cope with this um some not but people people really worry about it yeah so should be anything should anything be done uh, about it or can we just like adapt to this reality <laughs> okay yes well i i, I did <laughs> i mentioned motivation i guess and concentration and the one thing that teachers worry about more than anything i think um and i always whenever i do a training session on mobile learning i always do a, an activity at the beginning asking teachers to talk about their worries and concerns and the number one concern anywhere it doesn't matter where you go in the world the number one concern is always um distraction so they're distracting of course they're distracting you know lots of things are, i've got so many things on my desk here that are distracting um so i think the first thing i would say is that, that it's I, I think bans are really counterproductive i think banning things is is just completely the wrong way of doing it because we know what happens when you ban things people just don't really want to have them banned and they'll go to all sorts of lengths to get around those kind of those kind of bans particularly um teenagers who don't you know they like pushing the boundaries on those kind of bans i think there are certain things you can do the first thing i always do with with, with anyone is i ask people to put their phone on silent when they're in class so it's not buzzing all the time turn off notifications it doesn't buzz all the time it doesn't light up all the time that reduces the distraction quite a lot the second thing i ask people to do is to put it upside down so screen down on the table in front of them and at that point it's not buzzing or lighting up you can't see the screen it's basically a useless thing um, now there's a transactional thing to that because if people that I work with, they know that at some point in each class or training session, I'm going to ask them to use their mobile devices. So they're not worried about not seeing their mobile device for the next hour. At some point, they're going to see it and they'll pick it up and they'll use it. So I think that there is that kind of transactional thing of, of the, the people who work with me know that I'd like them to use their mobile devices and they're going to use them at some point. So they're not nervous and worried about them um, but they also know that hopefully that that i've got enough knowledge of what i do that i'll ask them to use them when they're useful and not before and not afterwards you know um, so i think it's about it is a transactional thing years ago we used to work with class contracts they were quite a big thing you know getting students 
we talk with the students, we figure out a list of rules, things the students will do, things the teacher will do, we sign it, we stick it up on the wall. Um, I think you can do the same kind of thing with technology. They call them acceptable use policies, AUPs, if you Google them. Um, is to come up with a contract of what we will use our devices for in class and what we won't use our devices for in class. Now, of course, people will stretch those rules and try and push against them. Break, and of course, they will. Because I didn't that's, catch that. Can you say it again? That's my phone. <laughs> well, whatever it thought I said. Um, I must have said okay, something or other. Um, so it's a question of, how, of sitting down rather Here's than. A matching video. Sorry. <laughs> Rather than sitting down and saying, look, put all your mobile phones in this box, you can have them back at the end of the class, which I've seen countless teachers do, or banning them outright, is, is just sit down and have a sensible conversation with people and say, look, you will use your, you will use your phone in the class, I guarantee it, uh, but just not quite yet. It'll, you know, it'll be soon. Um, I, don't, I think most, even young kids, most, most of them respond quite favorably to sensible conversations and sensible I hesitate to call them rules I think you know kind of like look we're, we're all in this together so let's work out how we're going to do it you know and, and, right. and let's try and stick to it because it'll be better for everyone um, I think yeah I, 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 kids don't have a shorter attention span than they used to I don't think they do um, I suspect that more adults my age have a shorter attention span than we used to than kids. Kids are very, very good at concentrating on things. It's just they want to concentrate, as they always have done, they want to concentrate on the things that they want to concentrate on. And they're not often the things that we want them to concentrate on. Blaming that on technology is as acceptable, I think, as blaming bullying on technology. All of these things have existed. Distraction is not a technology thing. It's a class management thing or a task design thing, but it's not a technology thing. In the same way that bullying isn't a technology thing. Bullying is different with technology, but I know plenty of people who were bullied in the 1970s and 80s. Yeah, but the essence is just the same, yeah? Yes. The tools like the, are different. The medium changes. Yeah, but the, yeah. The, the, the message remains, I think. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there this you go. Is it. Yeah, this is it. So, uh, we've come to the end of okay. uh, our uh, lovely conversation. I, I, I wonder, I, I wonder I, if the mobile sit through the whole thing. <laughs> 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 yeah, thank you so much. And we, we have to do two things still. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing was we need to congratulate uh, the person who uh, asked the best question and you've chosen this question. And it was in the Mesensava. Uh -huh. And her question was about uh, the social aspect, yeah, so the real world communication and online communication. Uh -huh. Yeah, I also believe that it was a great um, yeah, me too. Yeah. question. Yeah, and so Ina, you're going to receive uh, the book Going Mobile, and Gavin will sign it uh, oh, okay. when he comes to Russia. Uh, so this is all going to be my responsibility. <laughs> and uh, we need to announce your training session uh -huh. in St. Petersburg and in Novosibirsk. Right. Yeah. So first, you come to Saint Petersburg. Correct. And yeah. that's going to be on the thirtieth of October. Yes. More than in a month, and it's going to be one day training. Uh huh. And you're going to be mostly talking about digital literacy. Uh, digital literacy and mobile learning together. So combining those two things, you know, looking at, at how it all fits together in in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you go to Novosibirsk for two days. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the it's training with the top up. Oh? No, no, uh, Novosibirsk is a new place for me. I've, I've been to uh -huh. many places in Russia, but I've never been there yet. So I'm yeah. excited to see a new place. Yeah. And there's going to be two days. Yes. Yeah? So yeah. what what else are you going to be talking about? I'm just going to be doing the same thing, but talking a lot more slowly. <laughs> okay. No, I'm kidding. It's, it, 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 it's just looking at that topic in, in a bit more depth. That's in a bit more depth, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. So, yeah, I'm going to post the link to um, the website and you can purchase the tickets and I'm very sure that it's going to be very, very exciting and I'm really, really looking forward to meet you here in St. Petersburg. Hopefully, it will 
won't be that much cold. <laughs> That's okay. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing St. Pete again. It's been a few years since I was there, so oh, yeah. looking forward to that. Yeah, so thank you very much one more time. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um,